Well, I guess the it, it points out what we Republicans have often said about the Demo Democratic Party. You can never get too big. And I'm really predicting whatever happens with Al Gore, Nader's presence, and particularly if it's clear that he's made an impact on this election, will nudge the party even further left. This is, promises to be as, as exciting a post-campaign debate as the whole campaign was. Well, on that uh, point, uh, Nader said a short while ago, Larry King interviewed him earlier, shortly past 10 o'clock this week, we become a viable watchdog party. But a question, a point you were making earlier, Mary, Ralph Nader has set a pox on both your houses. He well, doesn't he, think either Gore or Bush cuts the mustard. Well, there, that was, a, uh, I believe, a cynical strategy of his. Clearly, there were huge differences. And in the end, he was saying, he sort of got in cahoots with Gephardt and the other Democratic leaders to say, vote for Democratic con uh, congressmen and senators. He knows there's a huge difference between them, but he was appealing to that kind of Ventura, that maverick, that, that, indif that independent vote voter who really does uh, have a cynical view about politics in general. Very cynical on, the, on behalf of Ralph Nader, but he knows there's a huge difference. I, 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 I would just remind everyone who voted for Ralph Nader, if over the next four years they have to watch George Bush appoint people to the <laughs> Supreme Court and to all of the sub-cabinet positions, all of those positions in OSHA so and EPA and regulatory agencies that really count in our system of government. They watch how those positions are filled versus how Al Gore would have uh, filled them. Then they'll know uh, how they spent their vote this election night. You All know, right. I think a lot of people voted for Bush because of the what he is going to bring into government. Those people that he brought with him on the campaign trail, notably Colin Powell, who will be a typical kind of appointee in a Bush administration. All right. Mary Madeline, Mike McCurry. We've seen you several times. We're going to see you several times more before this night is over. It is, uh, what, 22 minutes? No, 18 minutes before the bewitching hour of midnight Eastern time. And uh, we're still counting. There are still seven states, and Jeff Greenfield has his hand in front of my face, so he wants to say something. Jeff. Oh, I'm sorry to be so impolite, but, but, you, but, you know, I just want to point out something a little ahead of time, thanks to our staff. If Al Gore picks up Iowa and the one electoral vote out in Maine and Florida, which and I was about to say that we are giving Al Gore. Okay, then and this I will formally announce. CNN uh, announces we, as we described earlier, Maine is one of the two states that can split its electoral vote by congressional district. We're now prepared to say that Al Gore has all four of Maine's electoral votes. So as you can see, the total there is 231 is this total Gore. Correct? This should it is be the, 232? Or should it be 232? Yeah. It was 231. All right, 232 no, now. Okay, now, so here's I the point. Corrected. I stand corrected. I'm told that the 231 is correct. Okay. And uh, just uh, at 229, and this is Governor Bush. If, and Jeff, keep talking. If Al Gore <laughs> wins Iowa and, Al, and uh, Al Gore wins Florida and George Bush wins Arkansas and Alaska, we have an electoral tie. 269, 269, no one with an electoral majority, and Come either on. they find an elector to defect or it goes to the House of Representatives. There were more than 70 mathematical possibilities that that could happen, I was told, and we may be facing one of them. Right. And a couple of people have asked me, can George Bush still win without Florida? And the answer is yes, he can. He's at 229 electoral votes right now, and there are still 54, I think without Maine, 53 electoral votes out. He needs 41 more to get 270. So he could win without carrying Florida, but he'd have to carry just about all of the rest of those states, 41 out of the 53 electoral votes in the remaining states, to do it. This, this depends on a split that doesn't, is mathematically tricky, because Oregon and Washington, uh, I believe, have to also fall into um, Bush's column. But we are looking at a race that is so close, so late, that all of the pre-election predictions in this sense, in this sense, were right. accurate, which is to say it is unpredictable. That's right. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. And if it is a tie, boy, are we going to have a good time talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be a hunt well. for electors. Each side will be looking for electors. Because, because look, you know, in December, the electors meet in their respective mm -hmm. state capitals to vote. Mm -hmm. So each side will claim a moral victory if they edged out the other in popular votes, and they'll try to get an elector to 
to defect to the winning they side in the popular it, they vote. They won't let it stay a tie, is what you're saying. They, they're going to try not to let it stay a tie, the because they're going to say, morally, the person who got the most votes from the people should win. They're going to have to find an elector who will defect. Those electors are chosen for their loyalty. But can you Jeff imagine Green. the onus on the person who made the switch? Well, <laughs> Jeff, how did the electors in your novel turn out? Well, <laughs> my novel wasn't quite as outrageous as what might happen with a tie. <laughs> All I did was kill off the president-elect in a photo opportunity. But the fact of the matter is, the basis of, of all of this argument is that while states can try to punish electors who defect, uh, you know, fines and stuff, mm -hmm. the Congress so far, when an elector has been faithless, has in fact said, no, we're going to count the vote. Now, it's never mattered. But there is some precedent to say if, an, if there's one of these electors, let's say Bush wins the popular vote, and one of these Gore electors says, you know, it's a tie, I think I should go with the popular vote winner, he can be ostracized, he'll probably never get a Democratic Party job, but they can't stop him from casting the vote. And it is a, it is a Congress in January that decides whether the vote is valid. And so far, it looks like it will be a Republican Congress. I'm looking, uh, speaking of a potential tie, I'm looking at the, the Republican pollster, Alex Gage, mm -hmm. working with Fred Steeper, who predicted just this scenario about a, about a week and a half ago. And he figured it out, and it's, it's, uh, it is coming to uh, to fruition almost exactly as he predicted. Of course, well, there's still six or seven states out. That's right. Including Florida. Yeah, including Florida, which is a big one. And he had given that to Al Gore, and he still had a tie. Well, that's yeah. how it so, works out. And that, if, if Bush takes Florida, I, I, you know, not only will there be a lot of exit poll and people mm -hmm. who may have a new job, but it won't happen. Oh, boy. Let me interrupt our conversation. Uh, Arizona now, CNN declares, goes to Governor Bush. Arizona's eight electoral votes in the governor's column. Mm -hmm. And that is a significant win because Arizona had voted Republican in every election from 1948 for Harry, uh, since Harry Truman. It voted for Harry Truman, then it voted Republican in every election after that until it voted for Bill Clinton in 1996. And now it's gone back into the Republican column. Home of John McCain. He represents that state in the United States Senate. And, uh, and the primary there, no surprise, uh, John McCain beat yes. George Bush by almost 25 points. Yeah. Actually, what happened in Arizona is interesting because they have a lot of seniors who have retired and live in Arizona. It appears from our exit polling that they voted heavily for George Bush and they put him over. What carried the state for Bill Clinton in 1996 was a heavy vote among Hispanic Americans who voted very heavily Democratic. So you had a Hispanic Democratic vote and a senior vote that was heavily Republican. It appears that the seniors have won it this time. But what will be interesting to find out is why it was took so okay. long to fall into the Bush column. It will be interesting to look at those okay. numbers. We, we, have, we do have the senior vote in Arizona. Let's take a look at what our exit poll showed among voters over 65 in Arizona. They were the key to the Bush victory. 57% of them voted for Bush, 40% for Gore. Now, remember that um, the Social Security issue, the Medicare issue, the prescription drugs issue was supposed to pay off handsomely for Al Gore among seniors. Certainly didn't work that way in Arizona because the seniors in Arizona voted very strongly for George Bush and delivered that state to him. So don't take the senior vote for granted. Even for the Democrats this year, Social Security issue didn't work the way a lot of people predicted. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to hear from, uh, or talk with, I should say, the Republican Speaker of the House of Representatives, Dennis Haster. We'll be back in a moment. The United States of America still does not have a new president at this late hour. Back and forth, nip and tuck. The governor and the vice president have traded the electoral lead. Right now, Governor Bush has gone back up on top, 237 electoral votes to Vice President Gore's 231. This is the electoral map as it stands. This is the raw vote with 66% of precincts reporting. 
You can see that Governor Bush has 49% of the vote, or roughly 34.2 million votes, to Vice President Gore's 48%, or 33.7 million votes. It's running as the closest since Humphrey and Nixon in 1968, Bernie. That's right, and if that was 66% of the vote, that was about 68 million votes. So it looks like we're going to have a little over 100 million voters mm -hmm. casting ballots. It's a little higher than usual, but not spectacularly high. Wolf Blitzer. Race is underway in the House. What's the latest? We're taking a close look at the House races. There's one net pickup we can report right now in Long Island. Felix Grucci, the Republican, beating Regina Seltzer. This was the seat that Michael Forbes lost in the Democratic primary. He's the former Republican who turned Democratic. Let's take a look at what we can report on the balance of power in the House of Representatives right now. Very, very close so far. If you take a look at all the numbers, they're still undecided, and they're still about three, the, only about three-fourths of the seats have been determined right now. So far, we can say the Republicans have a net gain of two seats. We're still waiting, Stuart Rothenberg, for some seats out of the West Coast, though. And not just the West Coast, Wolf. We've got a, two squeakers in Jersey, one in West Virginia, one in Scranton, one in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where Heather Wilson is in trouble, all across the country. We've got a lot of close ones. We're going to be watching all of those races right now back to the National Desk. All right, Wolf Blitzer, Stu Rothenberg, joining us from yeah, Aurora, Illinois, his hometown, the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Dennis Hastert. Mr. Speaker, thank you for being with us. As you hear this analysis from uh, Stu and, and Wolf, uh, what's your reaction? Republicans, two up net at this point, but we're still waiting for some important races to come in. Well, we're cautiously optimistic. Uh, we have uh, been able to defend our seats in Kentucky and North Carolina that we thought that we ha may have a challenge. Uh, we have an interesting uh, race in Connecticut uh, that we may uh, pick up a seat that we didn't expect. And, uh, you know, we have to go in. I think uh, we're doing as well as we can expect. It's, uh, it's going to be a long night. Uh, we have to see what happens in California, obviously. But I, I feel good about the, the position that we're in. When do you think you'll have a sense of what the new house is going to look like? Well, it might be uh, early tomorrow morning before we really know what the <laughs> how early look like. or how late I should say. <laughs> I wish I know. I guess we're all looking at that crystal ball. Yeah. It probably won't be uh, much before we uh, determine who the new president's going to be. Well, speaking of that, uh, we're looking at a very close race. Are you surprised, Mr. Speaker, that we're looking at a race with what 49 percent to 48 percent of the popular vote, and just a few what is it 231 Gore to 237 Bush? in the electoral vote at this point? Well, we just figured that this was going to be a tough race. We knew it was going to be close. Uh, we figured it was going to be close in the House. It was going to be close in the Senate. It was going to be close in the presidency. Nobody, obviously, in this uh, election period was running away with it, but we've tried to get our uh, themes out there, talking about balancing the budget and paying down the debt and a better education for our kids, and that have been pretty well united our, thematically, and I think that appeals to people. No matter what happens from here on out, it's clear that this country is divided in a big way in terms of its view, not only of the man it wants to lead the country for the next four years, but in terms of philosophy. That being the case, how can the House of Representatives and the Senate do business with a president when the mandate seems to be so split here? Well, you know, that's why we need uh, both in the House of Representatives and the Senate and in the presidency to try to bring people together. You know, the important issues, education, uh, health care, are things that should be partisan. They ought to be bipartisan. And uh, we need to, to be able to bring our arms together and, and get those things done. You know, 90% of the issues in health care, people agree on. We ought to be able to split the difference in the other 3% and get it done. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, when you say it needs to be bipartisan, are you saying that all the fault lies with the other party here? I'm not or? pointing the finger at anybody tonight. Uh, it was pr pretty evident in the House of Representatives this year that the strategy of the Democrats is to try to block everything so that they could run against a do-nothing Congress. We didn't let that happen, but it was awful tough to get anything done when that was the strategy. All right, uh, House Speaker Dennis Haster joining us from his hometown of Aurora, Illinois. We want to thank you very much for being with us, and we look forward to been my pleasure. talking with you very soon again once we know more about what the outcome of the House of Representatives will be. We are going to take a break.
And we'll be right back with much more coverage in about two and a half minutes. The last state, the polls close in the state of Alaska. We'll be back in a moment. And with that call. Tomorrow in the Crossfire, join Bill Press and Robert Novak as they take a look at the new administration in the White House. Tomorrow, 7.30 Eastern on CNN.